Trump appealing to a man he placed on the Supreme Court in an effort to end the cases against him. And who is that? Well, that person is Justice Brett Kavanaugh. And in this 67-page filing uh, filed by Trump's team today, the former president's legal team digging deep into Brett Kavanaugh's past to make their case as to why Trump should not be charged with trying to overturn the 2020 election. And as they go through this, they point to several statements uh, made by Kavanaugh, including this one. And they quote, a president who is concerned about an ongoing criminal investigation is almost inevitably going to do a worse job as president. Trump's team also, going way back in time, going to a Georgia law article that Kavanaugh wrote in which he says, and quoting again, prosecution or non-prosecution of a president is in short, inevitably and unavoidably a political act. Well, a political act, that of course echoes what Trump has been saying since the start of the investigation is that all of this, these court cases are political and election interference in their own right. And Trump's uh, filing today is his last ditch attempt to do two things. One of course is to delay the special counsel's election case altogether. And two is actually to take a step back and actually avoid being charged entirely for trying to overturn the 2020 election. And on that point, Trump's legal team says, quote, if immunity is not recognized, every future president will be forced to grapple with the prospect of possibly being criminally prosecuted after leaving office every time he or she makes a politically controversial decision. That would be the end of the presidency as we know it. Now, that argument was unanimously, of course, rejected by a federal appeals court. So just to be very clear here, what you're looking at in these 67 pages is Trump's last chance to make that case and to end these cases. Caitlin Polance is out front live in Washington to begin our coverage tonight. And Caitlin, what else stands out to you in this new filing by Team Trump? Well, Aaron, we've had a lot of court filings over the course of this investigation about presidential immunity, but the language here is really aimed at scaring justices on the Supreme Court who want to protect the presidency and executive power, executive authority. Some of the language Trump uses, he talks about post office trauma that presidents might experience if they could be prosecuted for committing crimes while they are in office. Uh, he also talks about the de facto blackmail and extortion that they could face while in office. He also writes, it could be the end of the presidency as we know it. That is a very stark phrasing of this threat that Trump's team perceives if there isn't some sort of immunity around the presidency. The other thing that stood out to me is that in one of these arguments over this 60 some page brief filing to the Supreme Court, Trump's team says motive shouldn't matter. And it's unfair to Trump if there's immunity for the presidency, but it falls away in a case like this where Trump or others could be accused of trying to hold on to power because they were trying to break the law to stay in power. Here's the direct quote. The court should reject the DC Circuit's alternative approach of denying a president criminal immunity when his conduct is allegedly motivated by the desire to remain in power lawfully. This approach risks creating the appearance of a gerrymandered ruling tailored to deprive only President Trump of immunity while leaving all other presidents untouched. So they're saying that even if a president is breaking the law to keep hold of that office, that is not a reason why there should not be a protection around the presidency and thus Trump should be protected here as well. All right, Caitlin, thank you very much. So I want to go straight to our legal expert, Ryan Goodman, because what Caitlin just said is pretty extraordinary. I mean, okay, they're saying um, because it's, it's tailored just to apply to him. Well, there's a reason that it applies only to him because he's the only one who actually tried to uh, overturn an election. Right. Um, so it's just, just this continual circular reasoning. As you go through the 67 pages, do you find anything more compelling in these arguments than you've heard from them before? So the first half of the brief, there's nothing really compelling, and I don't think any of the justices, maybe one, but I don't even think any of them will sign on to this idea that all presidents are absolutely immune for any conduct in office. That's just a bridge too far. Right. Well, sec you know, killing people. I mean, there are things. Yeah, exactly. Which, which, by the way, they've already said that if he had ordered someone to be killed, that that wouldn't count. But Team Trump has said that. But Team Trump has yes. said that. That's right. But the second half is a smart legal argument, which is to say to the court, look, when you decide that there's not absolute immunity, then give us a test in which you define what the boundaries are, then send this whole thing back down to the trial court to apply your new test which is a delay strategy. So the idea there being that then they hold hearings at the trial court and then they 
the Trump side can appeal any adverse hearings all the way back up to the Supreme Court. That's the move that's being made there. But it's a smart argument. It's the argument I think they should be making as, a, as smart lawyers. Right, which is, which is you need to put rules and you need to put a procedure and a test. Yes. Understandable. Okay. So do you think it's, 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 it has a chance of success? And in that context, what do you make of the fact that they repeatedly uh, appealed to Justice Kavanaugh, who, of course, was appointed by Trump, but said all these things and wrote all these things, which seem at least taken out of context to uh, support the argument that they're making. It's a good move to try to quote the justices back at themselves. Also, in one of the paragraphs, they have both Kavanaugh and Scalia quoted together. Mm -hmm. So generally speaking, that can work. I imagine that Jack Smith might do the same thing if he thinks there's something in Kavanaugh's writings. The problem for Trump is that it's not really what Kavanaugh was saying. Kavanaugh was talking about why an incumbent president should not be distracted by ongoing criminal prosecutions or investigations. That's the Kavanaugh argument. Kavanaugh, I don't think, wants to be associated with this absolute immunity argument which they're making. So it actually might turn him off. Right. But, and just to be clear, incumbent and Trump uh, is not incumbent. I mean, just to Absolutely. To and in fact, so the it's argument... It's not apples to apples. Right. And those folks who think that the incumbent president is immune make the argument that he's immune or she's immune until they leave office. And that's the... The situation we are in right now. Yeah. All right. All right, Ryan, thank you very much. And as we are tracking this breaking news, we've got more breaking developments right now, which is that Donald Trump uh, is now slamming the judge who ruled against him and his company in the Trump Warg fraud case because literally we are in a time click, time uh, ticking down situation. Trump running out of time to come up with $464 million. That is what he's required to come up with to post bond by law by Monday on the deadline. Are you looking forward to this campaign, this election? I've been, I mean, I've been campaigning. These, I've been got, campaigning. This how is... are you doing it? You've got all these legal cases mounting up. They valued Mar-a-Lago. Yeah. At $18 million. I mean... Because what, the courts are rigged. What's going the on? The courts are rigged. They did. They valued it. It had an appraisal at $1.5 billion, $1 billion, $2 billion. Who knows what it's worth? It's worth... Because that was good for their narrative. So they valued it at $18 million because... It's a crooked legal system, very crooked. That's why people are leaving New York. Companies are fleeing New York because of even this decision. As our own Daniel Dale has pointed out, what Judge Engron said was that a Palm Beach County tax assessment from the years, the decade of 2011 to 2021, appraised the market value of Mar-a-Lago between 18 and $28 million. Now, this all comes as Trump's lawyers admitted so far that he does not have the $464 million, which he is required to post by law by Monday. What that means is that if he is treated like every other defendant in a posting bond situation, um, you just have to do it. You have to sell assets. You have to do whatever you have to do to make that bond. And for Trump, that would mean that he may have to sell some of his most prized properties. These are mega-ticket items. Or risk watching the state of New York seize them as the state of New York has said it will. Out front now, someone who knows all of this inside out, the real estate industry inside out, Bess Friedman. She is the CEO of Brown Harris Stevens, which is a luxury real estate company that includes properties in New York, New Jersey, and Florida, all the locations we're talking about. And Bess is also a lawyer. So Bess, you know, if just, just taking a look at where we are, uh, today's Tuesday. <laughs> it's only Tuesday. Okay, but by Monday, he has to post the, this bond. If he hasn't started the process of selling any of his properties, and by the way, I don't even mean started. I mean, if you aren't really, really far down the path, these are big, big buildings. Does he have time to sell any of them by Monday? I, I mean, I think it's, it's a little, we don't have enough time. I mean, by Monday, that's really, I think you need at least 30 days to get any of these properties sold. Um, but the property that you alluded to, mar lago uh, potentially, that could be something that could be sold quickly. I think the valuation is something in the hundreds of millions, and I think there could be a buyer for something like that. And that would be, literally, if you're talking about doing that between now and Monday, that's picking up the phone, calling someone, and then literally writing a check. Yeah, I mean, there could be plenty of international people who want to buy that property. I mean, there's properties that are priced at 150 and 200 million that are nearby that. And Palm Beach is like the NVIDIA NVIDIA, excuse me, yeah. of real estate. It's just shot up like a rocket. And people do want to live there. They've moved there. So I think that would be the best case scenario uh, as to proper if he's trying to sell quickly. I would encourage that. So, all right. Now, that's $240 million estimated. I mean, who knows? You know, he's a desperate seller in this case. Someone picks up the phone and makes that call this week. So I don't know what it'd be. That's still half right. of what it would be. So when you look at other properties, I mean, 
you know, you've got his penthouse, Bloomberg values that at 40 million. I mean, that doesn't get you there either, but is that something you could even sell quickly? I mean, the good news about that property is the location is incredible. Uh, it's a condominium, which means it could sell quickly. You still have to get through a board process, a package, an application. Um, but it's a building that was built in the early 80s, so I don't know if it's been renovated. And remember, you know, not everybody wants that affiliation with that building, with the name. You know, it does have a stigma for some, and so that could yep. be a bit of a challenge. And so, you know, the price doesn't determine the market. The market determines the price. And so it will depend on if there's somebody who really wants to buy something like that and do a renovation and make it their own and is comfortable living in a building that has his name. And for every, that's not everybody's taste. So I think it could be a bit of a challenge. And so how do you, how do you really even turn something like this, this, this quickly? I mean, how, what is the process to even do this? And, and when you talk about it, someone who, you're, they're going to want to get a deal. Right. I well, mean, he is, this is the definition of a desperate seller. In this particular instance, you've got five days. Yeah, I mean, I think he needs to look at all of his assets in real estate. He has a lot of them, great locations, and he needs to figure out what those values are and get them on the market and get people looking at them. I'm sure there's interest. I mean, look, Jeffrey Epstein's mansion sold in New York City. It took some time. They had to cut the price, but there was somebody that was willing to buy that. Same with Bernie Madoff. We were able to sell his co-op. So people will buy the real estate. Um, it just will take time. But the sooner, the better. And the sooner they evaluate what he has and get it, out, get, get it out there, it will be better for him. All right, Bess, thank you very much.